It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is my friend Miriam Evans, and we're going to be talking about her brand new book, Glory Miracles, Creating Atmospheres for the Power of God to Flow. Miriam, it is truly an honor to see you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. Well, I am excited to introduce you to my audience. Now, I know most of the folks in the audience, they haven't had the pleasure of hanging out with you and Tommy and dinner and all the cool things we've gotten to do in the past year or two. Uh, So I'm going to kick this off by having you share a bit of the Miriam Evans origin story. So for all the folks in the audience meeting you for the first time, give them a little bit of context. What are a few things they should know about you? So... um... My husband and I are the founders, co-founders of our ministry, Revival Mandate International, and we have five children. Um, I homeschool them. I travel. And so that is an interesting mix uh, that we learn how to do daily, honestly, with the Holy Spirit, taking a day at a time and making sure that he helps us keep track. So like any day does not look like the day before. We work off of routines and not rigid schedules. So uh, that's kind of how that works. I get that question a lot. How do you do that? And so I just definitely stick with routines led by the Holy Spirit rather than time schedules. Um, And a little bit about myself. And uh, for those of you who have maybe read the book, you can read a little bit more in detail. But I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were uh, Baptist ministers and pastors. And um, we unfortunately just hit some bumps in the road as a larger family. My parents divorced and then we're no longer in ministry. And then my sisters and I kind of just grew up to think that being in ministry um, was not the route that anybody needed to go. We kind of had like, well, who would choose that? So the fact that I'm in ministry and the fact that I'm doing what I'm doing is definitely redemptive. Um, I knew of Jesus later on. I kind of went through a period of walking away from the Lord, but through a series of events and literally Jesus revealing himself to me, I came to know him and really rededicated my life to him, um, as a young adult in my twenties. Um, however, I was like the believers in Acts chapter eight, next chapter 19, where I was like, well, who is the Holy spirit? I was not, uh, familiar with the baptism of the Holy spirit. And so that was really a game changer for me is when I was introduced to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, I began to, um, I had a lot of physical infirmities in my body. And so that was one of the first things that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire really like took care of, if I could say it that way. Um, And I really was reintroduced to Jesus as Christ, the healer. And so I began to see him heal my body of different things from a neurological disorder that paralyzed the left side of my face. Um, Jesus healed that to like uh, two discs in my back that were due to an old sports injury. I I played volleyball all through college, high school and traveling. And um, he healed that. Um, I had um, uterine polyps that were an issue that were causing me to bleed at months at a time. I know that's TMI, but. I mean, like it was happening, it was real. And, and I, you know, was really sick feeling. I mean, I had, uh, reoccurring, uh, growths that would come up in my throat that would just, uh, inhibit my ability to talk and to speak. And I had so many infirmities going on in my body that I just had to live with. I had, um, I was medicated for high, uh, anxiety and torment disorder really that I had. I know they don't call them torment disorders, but that's what it was. I wasn't able to speak or sometimes I felt like things were choking me, especially in the night. And just when I began to really, and I talk about this in my book, one of the ways that we create atmospheres for the power of God to flow is to create atmospheres where people can not only come to salvation, but the finished work of the cross, which includes the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I like to tell people Jesus is our savior, but he's also our baptizer. So that's when I begin to see things clear up, really stuff that I thought was broken and not working. What does that mean? I became a Christian. What's why is this still broken? You know, I was really introduced to the beautiful part of the 
Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. I was introduced to the person of the Holy Spirit, and it really was a game changer in my life, just cultivating that relationship. And so um, it's just been a daily thing. And all those things I I was healed of and the torment and was able to get off that medication and I'm living free. So I'm very passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus, but how the gospel of Jesus is the power of God um, unto salvation and how we really have a hope with the power of the gospel here on earth, heaven invading earth through the power of the gospel and um, and really introducing people to the person of the Holy Spirit. So that's trying to make that a short nutshell of my origin and where I'm at today. It was a, a good long elevator ride. Uh, we would have gotten up a lot of floors with with that uh, that origin story. But but good. I, I love how you painted the picture and gave us um, a context where you came out of. Because I think a lot of assumption is if you write a book that has the word miracles in the title, is that you've been seeing these things since you were a little kid. Or and I'm assuming growing up in a Baptist household, signs, wonders, Holy Spirit, probably not a normal day to day part of the experience there. Uh, I'm kind of curious in terms of um, foundation, whose shoulders you stand on. Uh, you have du- dual forwards from both uh, our friends Bill Johnson and Randy Clark. Uh, would love to just hear about how those two complementary ministries really have sewn into and feed into the work that you and Tommy are doing. I, I was intrigued they had forwards from those two guys because obviously they've done a lot in healing together, even done some books together, but they're also two distinct streams at the same time. Absolutely. I'm truly honored and privileged that they are really, I would consider fathers of revival for our generation. And um, I love to study revival history. And so I really see that that is something that the Lord has graced them with an authority that they carry for our generation. And they're ones who are willing to pour into our generation, into my generation, even specifically because they were willing to write the forewords. Um, We first were introduced to Pastor Bill Johnson and Randy Clark during our tenure in Redding, California. Um, We're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now, but we did live in Redding, California for over four years. My husband attended uh, the BSSM, the the Bethel uh, School of Ministry out there, and um, he had the privilege of interning with Bill Johnson Ministries. And so we got to meet him and even meet Randy when Randy Clark would come in and do like the school of healing. And I did not go to the school. However, I was involved like in the healing room ministry. um, And I was also able to attend a lot of these conferences. And so I was like the kid at the candy shop. I just read about these guys and really resonated with them. I like to tell people, if you resonate with a particular spiritual leader, um, I believe it is a just a prophetic edge on what you may carry. And so I wanted to really learn what I could for them from them, according to Hebrews 13, seven, examine your spiritual leaders, examine their walk of faith, you know, imitate their faith, you know? So, um, so we really were able to have the favor to meet them, get to know them a little bit. And, um, keep up with their ministries. When we moved from Reading to Dallas, the church that we attend, we um, have a close relationship with our pastor, Jim and Becky Hennessy. So we were like a bridge and like, hey, let's have them, you know, let's have them over to be guest speakers, to speak at different things. Um, Cindy Jacobs is also a spiritual mother of mine, and we both attend Trinity Church with Pastor Jim and Becky. So between all of us, we've all like been able to bridge this really cool um, long distance kind of relationship and keep up with them. And they've been able to come over and speak at our church. And um, so they found out that I was writing this book and through just some communication, they were very gracious to say, yes, absolutely. We'll write the foreword and um, pouring into, I mean, you know, even just doing the edits of the book, Randy Clark was very gracious being the awesome scholar and teacher that he is to come in and help me get my facts straight in the statistics. And I just loved it. I was so honored for him to do that. And, and so, uh, for them to not only pour into our generation through speaking and through television engagements and things like that, for them to take the time to write the forward of my book and to help me with little things here and there in the book to correct really speaks volumes to me on, um, their 
roles, I believe, as a fivefold apostles, both of them, to really equip the body and to really pour into the next generation. Well, and uh, for anybody who's had the the privilege and honor of spending time behind the scenes with either Bill or Randy or both of them, they are two of the most top notch guys I've ever encountered. And just to see the humility they both walk in, the integrity, the character. And really, you know, for me, the thing that has always impressed me most with the many of the leaders uh, I've gotten to meet through the years is, you know, we read their books, we see them up on stages, but when you, when you get to be behind the scenes on and off, you know, you see it all comes out of a deep time in the prayer closet and in the word, and, you know, they're moving in great power and there's signs and wonders happening, but it, it's all come at a great cost. And this there's just been so many countless you know, hundreds and thousands of hours of spending time with God that goes into uh, doing what they do. And so I love that uh, you got to have some of the best leaders just pour into you. And that that also comes into this book as well. Uh, I always like to hear, and this is just as a publishing guy, you know, on the one hand, I go, we we sign a contract, we put something in a spreadsheet, and it goes in a calendar, and it's going to release. But I feel like God always does two things. There's something always timely for the author, because I feel when we write books, God makes us or helps us work out our own issues and wrestle with things in a unique way when we're pulling a book together. And so, you know, for you, why is this the right season for this book to come out? And also, even when we didn't necessarily plan it, I, you know, 95% of the time, books in our space, I feel like they come out at a time when the church needs this message, culture needs this message. So story behind the book, why for you and how is God using it to meet needs in culture right now? Yeah, so I really believe that um, it's been an opportunity for my voice to be unlocked, the writing of this book, to be able to talk to people about what it looks like to have healings and miracles that are central to the gospel. It's not a side issue. And I believe it's dual. I believe that's where we come into how it's benefiting the body of Christ, how it's benefiting people. Because honestly, Sean, I really believe that the Holy Spirit is preparing us for a great revival of his glory, of the glory of the Lord, the manifest presence of God that is going to invade earth with the heavenly presence of the Lord. And I believe that um, in this move of God that we are on the cusp of, I really believe that we're going to see notable miracles that bring glory to Jesus. During the writing of this book, I actually had a vision of Jesus and he had a sickle in his hand. And he was walking through a field of wheat and the sickle, he said, miracles will be the sickle that bring in the harvest. And so I really believe that through the writing of this book and, you know, through letting the message go out to people, that people are going to see that uh, healing and miracles are central to the gospel. They're not a side issue and that the purpose of a miracle is to bring glory and honor to Jesus and just with my husband traveling already, my myself and him together throughout the United States, we have seen the fires of revival get lit and souls come to Jesus because of the miraculous, because of his kindness, because of his mercy. And so I believe that we're going to begin to see the body of Christ rise up in power. I believe that God is equipping us for the harvest. And one of the ways that we are going to see a great harvest come to Jesus is to exercise our authority and power over sickness, disease, and death. One of the things I really appreciated is you press into topic areas I don't always see in terms of a book about glory and miracles. Um, One one thing I wrote down in my notes is hunger is the heart of everyday revivalists. Talk to us about hunger, maintaining a hunger, stewarding a hunger. Why is that critical? Well, I know for me, it's so critical because I was talking to the Lord, you know, sometimes we have like dreams in our heart, things that we want to do for God. But when we look in the grand scheme of things, we're like, how on earth am I going to be able to accomplish that? I don't feel qualified to accomplish that. I don't feel qualified. I don't feel like I have the right personality, fill in the blank, whatever. And as I was dreaming with God and talking and dialoguing with him about what I felt like he was telling me that, that my life plans were to bring him glory. I began to say, God, how am I going to lead revival? How am I going to see the sick healed and the dead raised and demons cast out? And I heard the Lord say, I'm not looking for experts. I'm just looking for the hungry. And that really freed me of a lot of 
performance. It freed me from a lot of self-introspection to get my eyes off of my inadequacy and on to who Jesus was. Because when we're hungry, we're actually in a place of humility where he can come in and perfect our weaknesses. He can come in and empower us through his Holy Spirit because we're hungry individuals that aren't full and that aren't thinking, well, you know what? I'm good where I'm at. I've I'm fine where I'm at, or I'm going to lean on my credentials. Nothing wrong with that. I really value credentials. And, and, you know, so I'm not saying that, but I believe that no matter what area we've achieved in, whether it, you know, I can sit here and, and, and name some really awesome testimonies, tell stories of testimonies of deaf ears opening and tumors disappearing and cancers dissolving after I've prayed. But if I don't remain hungry, I'm going to miss out on the point that I'm supposed to go deeper and deeper from glory to glory, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says that the Holy Spirit takes us from glory to glory, that we are constantly transforming into the image of Jesus. And so if we can remain hungry for more, then we're actually creating an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to take us from glory to glory into greater depths in my relationship, in my intimacy and friendship with Jesus. And also through that, there will be fruitfulness in the world around me. And so I really believe that when we talk about the glory, when we talk about the manifest presence of heaven invading earth, invading our lives, our personal world, when we talk about miracles, I would not see what I have seen today if it wasn't for hunger. You know, I think of John G. Lake, the great revivalist in the early 1900s. He saw the bubonic plague literally under a microscope dissolve in the palm of his hand because he had a revelation of Romans 8. He had a revelation of the dominion of a believer. But there's also a quote that I mentioned in that chapter where John G. Lake begins to talk about hunger because he's like, he felt so depleted at one point. And even his friends were like, brother, like you've seen great things more than all of us combined. How is it that you feel so depleted? And he begins to just talk about the the hunger that he has for the Lord to go deeper, that no matter what we've seen, no matter what we've accomplished for God, that our hunger to to have intimacy with him and and our hunger to be be able to host his presence and to be able to fellowship with the Holy Spirit is something that's going to allow us to go into greater depths of glory, um, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. So hunger is a very, very dear subject for me because I believe it keeps me from apathy. I believe it keeps me from remaining stagnant and familiar with the things of God because there's always more in the kingdom. And I believe that hunger opens up the door for us to experience more of God. Yeah, I I was glad you had that topic in the book just because through the years I've met people where you know, I could, as there are certain people I've traveled with through the years where I've had dinner with them 40, 50 times, and I could tell you the stories they're going to tell at the dinner. And it always broke my heart when there were stories from like 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm like, in my heart, I'm going, is God not moving in your life now? How have you lost that? Where'd your hunger go? God, you know, I'm, I'm, we're all blessed by your old stories, but if God's not moving actively in your life today, I kind of question like what, how have you gotten so stale? So I'm, I'm glad you addressed that topic in the book. Um, and another topic that I was excited about, but kind of surprised, uh, principle of honor uh, as a, a way to create an atmosphere where miracles happen. That was a surprise for me in the book. Talk to us a little bit about that. And I, and I like to go off the beaten path. I mean, often in these interviews, people are like, tell us a bunch of miracle stories and healings that happened and testimonies. And that's awesome. But when I see people going in unique directions, like we got to pull on some of this other meat from the book, because I know in other interviews, people don't want to go there. So that's why I go there. Yeah, I love it. I love that so much because I really believe that in order for us to live a life of the miraculous, um, we have to have foundations. And I believe that these foundations that I talk about in my book, specifically hunger or honor, are foundations that I've learned through my friendship with the Holy Spirit. Because um, I remember being a little girl and um, I mentioned earlier that I grew up in a Baptist home. And while that was not taught in the theological seminary that my parents both graduated from, the life of the miraculous, they actually um, were able to put aside their theological differences and they would have Benny Hinn playing in our home growing up. 
And that's not something that would be normal for a Baptist family, you know? And the reason why they did that is because I remember my parents, specifically even my dad, talking to me about honor. And I'll give you an example. He would say, a lot of people don't like Benny Hinn. A lot of people in the denomination that we are in do not believe or agree with his style. And they don't believe that miracles are for today. He said, but if you will just watch with an open mind, and he would talk to me like this as a little kid. He's like, you can feel God if you will just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And he said, put aside your preference, put aside the style. Can you find a silver lining? Can you find where the Holy Spirit is in this minister? And I learned as a young child that regardless of our opinions of people, their style, their personality, how they flow, if we can find where the Holy Spirit is in something, we can actually receive from him. We can receive an impartation. We can receive a transference of anointing. We can actually receive a miracle because we're willing to honor the Holy Spirit at work within them. We're willing to honor the fact that Christ is being preached in this person, regardless of their style that might be different than mine, regardless of maybe their denomination, regardless of their theological background. Can we find the thread of where Christ is preached and honored and where the flow of the Holy Spirit is being honored. And so I talk about different stories where I've been in, in my chapter, I talk about different stories where I've been in like a conference or I've been in a meeting and miracles start happening. I can tangibly discern a a miracle anointing, if we can call it that. I can tangibly discern where the Holy Spirit is beginning to move and, and perform miracles in people's body. And I remember being, and I, and I share this message and I don't share names because that's besides the point, but I remember being in this particular, uh, meeting and I had a couple friends leave and walk out of the meeting. And they said, we can't sit here through this, like this guy. And they start rambling factual things about this particular minister that, okay, I get it. It's true. But I heard the Holy spirit say, just wait a minute. If you can bypass that, I'm actually moving right now through this individual, and I'm actually moving in the room, I want you to receive something. And I remember I received something from the Holy Spirit himself. I didn't receive something through this person's personality or through their particular maybe choice that they made that people didn't agree with. But I I, it, I had to really focus at that moment. And I had to really sit and hear and watch what the Holy Spirit, because he was honoring people's faith in the room. And he was honoring his word. You know, the Bible, the gospel was being preached at that moment. And people were responding by faith. And the Holy Spirit was confirming the gospel. The Holy Spirit wasn't confirming maybe the the character flaw, but he was confirming the gospel because that's what he does. And he was confirming and affirming the faith that people had to respond to the preaching of the gospel with the miraculous. So I just talk about, I talk about that angle. And I also talk about honor. We also have to honor the Holy Spirit by cultivating character along with gifting in our life so that we can bring honor to the Lord through character and through purity. So um, just in a nutshell, that's a little bit of the angle that I take honoring others, not speaking ill, ill towards others, gossiping, slander, so many things that can unfortunately happen in the world of ministry. And um, I really believe that we, you know, the Bible talks clearly about unity, about the anointing that comes through unity. We see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit powerfully happen in the upper room because they were in one accord. And so I believe that when we can come together in honor and in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the different streams will come together to form the river of God. And um, it's just a little bit of what I talk about as far as how honor will open up a gate of glory and will open up an atmosphere for heaven to dwell. Yeah, that's such a big topic in in our circles. And, and I would say just from my vantage point, 
Uh, you know, there are people that, because I grew up in very conservative circles, so I've gotten to meet people that I was warned not to follow or read or, you know, I've had my colleagues where when we travel to certain churches, people are like, don't be deceived by those people and 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 all that. So it's been an adventure uh, to say the least. But um, the deeper I've grown in this space, you know, as I've had conversations with people and I could just find out how some of these controversial leaders have just abundantly blessed people and sown into people's lives and just done crazy things to care for people and things that they don't ever share publicly. And so I feel like on the one hand, you get, you're always going to have the haters. You'll get kind of the public caricature of somebody in their ministry. Uh, yet you get to know people who in different seasons have been greatly blessed by these people and their ministries. And you find out, oh, wow, God, God is moving. And there's so much more happening than I see on the surface or I see uh, in social media. And and I would say for me, that's been one of the most humbling things because you come into this space, you have opinions and things you think. And then when you get to really meet people and meet people who've been blessed by these different folks, you're like, oh, wow, God, I had no idea that that's how you're using that individual. Even if they make me nervous still, wow, you really did something amazing through them. And, and that continues to keep me humble as I meet new people where I don't always understand. And boy, God surprises me every, every single day, it seems often. Oh, sure. Um, and as it, a side note, I have, I have met Benny Hinn in person, and he really is an incredible person, very humble and loves the Holy Spirit. So I am going to throw that years later, I was able to meet him, had the pleasure and honor of meeting him. And I was very grateful to to do so. So I'm with you, Sean. I think we have to be really careful about how we talk about others without truly understanding or able to meet the individual, you know? Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen Benny preach at a Global Awakening event, uh, but one of my good friends, Troy Brewer, way back in the day before anybody knew who he was, he, Troy and his wife were in Israel, and they run into Benny Hinn and his entourage. And again, this is many, many years ago, and Benny just saw the Lord on him and just blessed their socks off and made them part of their group and upgraded their room and just loved on them for a whole week. And they were destitute as church mice. Somebody had given gifted them a trip to Israel and they really had no money to do anything. And Benny prophesied over Troy that he would have this massive worldwide ministry, but it wouldn't actually come about until he turned 50. And he was in his late twenties at that point. And, you know, Troy is, I believe he's 55 or 56 now, but just as Benny prophesied when he got to 50 the things that opened up are off the charts and crazy. And what Benny spoke over his life came to pass exactly as he had prophesied in Israel. And so, um, you know, when you get to see things like that, where it's a couple of decades later, these things that, that somebody spoke prophetically actually happened, um, or, you know, when he had no reason to bless Troy and Leanna, making them part of their tour group and everything, yet God moved on him to do that. And so that that's my favorite Benny Hinn story, because I just love Troy and, and his ministry so much. Um, and so, it, again, those are the sorts of things you get to hear when you meet people. Where it gives you a little perspective and be like, wow, God's really using people, even, even if they sometimes make me uncomfortable. Uh, I think the, the place I'd love to kind of wrap as we begin to finish up the interview uh, is just uh, you, you talk about tapping into that inheritance of Kind of the miracle power of healing revivalists of old. I've heard a lot of talk about deep wells of revival that we need to tap into in that season. Talk to us a little bit uh, about kind of looking to the people whose shoulders we're standing on as we press into what God's doing in this season. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love this subject so much. Again, it, it it is a culture of honor, honoring the pioneers that have gone before us and picking up batons that have either been laid down um, by those that have gone before us that have graduated and upgraded to heaven, you know, and uh, the Bible talks about in the book of Genesis, uh, where Isaac redug the wells of his father, Abraham, because the Philistines had thrown dirt on it after his father passed away. And so we see this biblical principle of going to redig things that pioneers, fathers, mothers of the faith that, that have gone before us, you know, uh, I, I also love the scripture in Jeremiah where it talks about ask God for the ancient paths. Where is the ancient path, the good way, the way that will bless your souls? And so there are paths that have been paved before us in the spirit, whether it be people like Maria Woodworth Etter, who paved a way for women to preach the gospel when they weren't even allowed to vote, or whether it be, you know, paving the way for people like 
Smith Wigglesworth, who, you know, raised the dead, who cultivated the presence of God in such a way that his shadow healed the sick, just like Peter in Acts 5.15, where people would bring the sick in San Francisco and, and they would bring them out knowing that Smith Wigglesworth was going to, to walk and pass by. So I believe that these are places, reference points that we can say, okay, God, I believe that you're going to do it again, but even greater because greater is the way of the kingdom. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said, these same miracles you will do, but even greater because I go to my father and he pleads on our behalf to the father. He's our greatest intercessor. And so the way of the kingdom, the principle of the kingdom is multiplication and it's greater. And so while it feels like we're kind of playing catch up a little bit in our generation, we're not quite seeing what these generals have seen. I do believe that there is a spirit of acceleration that's been released on our generation, Sean, and younger. I do believe that as we begin to tap in and take ownership for our generation, hungry before the Lord, stewarding his presence in our life, that God is going to accelerate our generation in this end time harvest that we're in to be able to step into the greater works that Jesus prophesied. And it begins with honoring what they have done and not just stopping there, but believing that God wants to pour out his spirit on us, on all flesh, on us to even step into greater things. So um, I believe one way that we dig the wells of revival is not only to study and learn the generals that have gone before us, but to also take risks, take risks right now where we're at, give God something to work with and partner with him to see the kingdom of God manifest on earth uh, as it is in heaven. And I always like to kind of wrap with this question uh, in terms of the reader's journey with the book. Uh, they, they spend the time, they work through the book. How, how, you know, what, what does success look like in, for you with the reader? How do you want to see them shifted? How do you want to see them operating and moving differently after encountering this message? I would really love to see uh, a glory generation, a generation of people who um, are passionate about hosting the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit, because it is from his presence that we'll get everything. You know, Matthew 6, that we seek first the kingdom. So I'm passionate about stirring up a hunger through my book in this generation to host the presence of the Lord, to host the Holy Spirit, to host the spirit of glory so that they can be a part of this glory generation, this move of glory, this revival glory, if you will, that is coming, this awareness of the presence of God invading earth to transform the world around us. So that's that's my hope is that there would be a generation of people that would be so hungry to host the Holy Spirit in such a way that we really do bring in a harvest for Jesus and that Jesus would see the, the reward of his suffering. And Miriam, in terms of people connecting with your ministry, finding out more about this book and your other resources, where do we discover you on the web? Yes, so you can learn more about us and be updated with all of our uh, future itinerary and what's going on at www.revivalmandate.org. Um, I'm also on Instagram. You can search me there and uh, stay updated with what we're doing and what life looks like right now and a city that we might be coming to new, near you to host a revival event or a miracle meeting and um, really mobilizing people in this hour. So we would love to have all of you listeners, viewers, and readers a part of that. And like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll have links in the description and in the show notes to Miriam and Tommy's website, as well as places where you can pick up your very own copy of her new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Miriam Evans. Once again, our book today was Glory Miracles, Creating Atmospheres for the Power of God to Flow. And Miriam, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Sean.